Hello, and welcome to the second part of the 555 timer operation module. In this module, we'll be going over in a little bit more detail the operation of the one-shot module. This was covered in class, but we'll go over it again just in case some people missed it. So at this point, we've already determined exactly how our trigger circuit works. Additionally, we know how our low-pass filter works, and we know how our motor works. So all that's really left is to find out how our one shot turns our trigger pulses into our output pulses. Now if we look at the inside of the 555 just a little bit closer, we can recall that our trigger pulse looks like this simply falling edge which then rises again. Internally to the 555 timer, this lower comparator compares our trigger pulse to a voltage of one-third VCC, it's about this level here, in order to generate the set pulse for our internal SR flip-flop. And so as soon as trigger drops low, this set pulse goes high, and we end up setting our, our RS flip-flop, which makes Q go high and Q0 go low. So as soon as we set, Q goes high, Q0 goes low. Now, if we just know that that happens, we can take a look at how the rest of the circuit functions. Here again, up in the top, we have our trigger pulse. And we can see that if trigger goes high right here, it's going to send Q high, Q naught's going to go low. As soon as Q naught goes low, that's going to force this node low, which is going to turn off our switch. So the switch is going to turn off, which allows C2 to be charged through R2 up to some voltage. Now as soon as C2 charges high enough, it's going to flip this comparator, send reset high, which is going to force output low, which is going to force Q0 high. Once Q0 goes high, this switch is going to turn into a short circuit and it's going to short C2. So let's just draw out some of these waveforms. Now, when we start, Q0 is sitting high. We're assuming at some point we had a reset signal, and so Q0 is sitting high. Additionally, the voltage across our cap or our discharge node and our threshold node is sitting at low because since reset, since Q is high, this switch is on, and so C2 is being shorted to ground. And we know that our reset signal is low. We can tell that because this node here is at zero volts, meaning that the positive is lower than the negative on this comparator, meaning that resets sitting at zero volts. Now as soon as we get a trigger pulse right here, as soon as we have a set pulse, remember Q0 is going to drop low, so Q0 drops low, and Q0 is going to stay that way for a while, so we know Q0 is going to be low. As soon as that drops low, we turn this switch off, right? This node has just dropped low, which turns this switch off. And now C2 can begin to charge through R2. So C2 is going to charge up in some sort of a, an exponential fashion here. It's just going to start increasing. And reset is still low. Nothing's changed there. Now as soon as the voltage on C2, or the voltage right here, passes two-thirds of VCC, you can see that reset's going to shoot high. So really, as soon as we get to two-thirds VCC, reset is going to pulse high. Now, when reset pulses high, q naught's going to increase. And so q naught has now jumped up. As soon as q naught jumps up, this switch turns on, which is going to short this voltage right here. It's going to drop back down and sit at zero, and as soon as that voltage drops down, reset drops low again. And so we really only have a little pulse of reset. We had our C2 rising and then dropping down when it hit two-thirds VCC, and Q0 was low during this rising portion here, so these things are time aligned, and then went back high as soon as this voltage dropped low again. 
And so that's what our waveform looks like here. And then it's going to repeat the next cycle. Q0 drops low on the rising edge of our set pulse. We begin to charge C2 on that rising edge. And reset stays low until we hit 2 thirds VCC. When reset pulses and forces that voltage back down again. So that's how this circuit implements a one shot. And our output is then going to be the inverse of Q bar, meaning that this time here is going to be our T on. That's the time we'd like to solve for. So as this circuit transitions through these states, there's really only two different equivalent circuits we need to be concerned about. The first one is what happens during this first time and this second time period here. And that's this first equivalent circuit here. During this portion of time, Q0 is high, as we can see. And because Q0 is high, this switch is on. And so C2 is shorted. And you can see that here, C2 shorted. Now during this period of time, nothing very interesting happens. We're simply running our 5 volts through R2 to ground. C2 is not charging. This node right here, corresponding to this node, is stuck at 0 volts. The more interesting time period is this, this second period right here between these two red lines, where we're actually charging our capacitor and waiting for it to hit 2 thirds VCC. During this period of time, Q naught's low. If Q naught's low, that means that this switch is an open circuit, as you can see in this second equivalent. So what we need to solve is the time it takes this second equivalent circuit to charge C2's voltage from zero to two-thirds of VCC. It's a very similar process to determining our trigger time. So to start out solving this, we can write our node equations. And here we have one current coming in this way and a current leaving this way. We're solving for this voltage right here. So we'll get 5 volts minus VC2 over R2. And this is going to equal C DVC2 DT. Now we can multiply through by R2 and rearrange. We're going to get R2C DVC2 DT plus VC2 equals 5 volts. Now this equation is very similar to the one we got when solving for T-trigger. In fact, it's the same equation, and so we immediately know what the solution is going to be. We're going to end up with Vc2 of T equals 5 times 1 minus E to the minus T over R2C2. So that's our equation for Vc2. But what we're really interested in is at what point in time does VC2 equal 2 thirds VCC. So we want to know when this happens. Because as soon as it hits there, that's going to set our T on pulse length. So beginning from our solution in the last slide, we can solve this again. And now what we're really concerned with 2 thirds VCC equals VCC 1 minus E to the minus T on, because at T on we get this, over R2 C2. Now, at this point, we can simply cancel our VCCs, and we can throw a 1 onto the other side, so we'll subtract 1 from both sides. We're going to have minus 1 third equals minus E to the T on over R2 C2. Let's make both sides positive. Um, now we can flip both sides upside down so that we have 3 equals e to the positive t on over r2 c2. Take the logarithm of both sides and multiply through by r2 c2. means that we know now that t on is going to equal r2 c2 times the natural log of 3. And we can use this equation to solve for t on. Remember, we need T on to be about 90% or so of our minimum encoder period, which happens at our maximum encoder frequency. Once we've solved for R2C2 in that fashion, we now know how to select every component value seen here. 
Remember R1, C1 were selected to ensure that our trigger pulse was 1 to 10 microseconds, something in that range. We then select R2, C2 in order to ensure that our one shot outputs a pulse of about 90% of our minimum encoder period. And then we selected R3, C3 in order to filter the output PWM to get a fairly constant speed. It'll have some ripple on the top. And once we've solved for that, that's really the last set of components that we need enable to get this circuit to function properly and how we'd like.